All right, well, I'm excited to be here. This is my second dry brush demo. I did it a couple of weeks ago in Gainesville. So if you were there for that, and I know that some of you were, I have changed it up a little bit, so you might not fall asleep this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, since there's so many new faces, and even though I feel like a new member, there's so many people that have joined since me, I thought I'd start out a little bit about my background and how I got to this point of dry brush painting. Um, my background is computer science. I was a Navy photographer. So I have artistic creativity and analysis and everything. Um, and a few years ago when I was fortunate to retire unexpectedly early, I thought I would pursue some of my crafts more. And I'm actually a bobbin lace maker. And bobbin lace is made with these tiny little five inch long spindles that are about a quarter inch wide. And they can be very decorative and painted up and have all sorts of embellishment, or it can be very plain. And there are probably 50 different styles depending on what city and what country that particular area of lace is made in. So I thought, wow, I could probably make my own bobbins. So I spent $400, bought a lathe, and thought, this is going to be cool. And I went to Woodcraft because I wanted to learn how to use the lathe because I'd never been around one. And I took a pen turning class, and my lady came with a 25 starter pack of pens. So I made a bunch of pens and thought they were awesome, and now I hide them. <laughs> um, but I realized by going through the catalogs and online all the things you could do uh, with a lathe. And only being probably five months into it, I got a bug and said, I'm going to go to the, the symposium in Raleigh. And I drove up there and went, and even Keith had told me it's going to be like drinking water from a fire house hose. And it was, but it was so inspirational because I thought all wood should be natural and brown. And, and then I saw all the embellishments. So slowly I just started changing and doing new things. Um, and I recently learned a lot about dry brush painting. And I really like that because I like to embellish my work. I used to spin brown and brown was great, and now. I can't wait to get to the embellishment part of it. I think about what I can make on the lathe that I can embellish instead of what I want to make on the lathe and then thinking what to do with it. So anyway, I started doing this dry brush training technique. And um, one of the first pieces I did is after I had gone early in my time of turning to Moody Lopez in the Tampa area, um, I took a three-day class with him. And one of the things we made was a spear. And it was just round, and it had burnished marks from the, the jigs that held it. And it went into my trauma center basket for a while. And then after a while, I thought, you know what? I could embellish this. So I put it back on, sanded off all the bad stuff, and carved it according to the grain, and then decided to dry brush paint it. So I painted the whole thing black. And I had to use some cuppers to make the holes, and I dry brush painted it. I liked it so much, I did this blue one. I'm going to pass these around as I go. And I'll show them again in my slide presentation. In fact, let's go ahead and go to that before I start passing stuff. Can I keep continuing? Yes, please. <coughs> Are we changing over here on the switch? Really good. You know that. Sorry. PowerPoint? That's nice. I'm sorry. It's hard to find a good So what I'm going to do is show some examples of this PowerPoint and some of the artwork that uses a dry brush technique and I really admire. I'm going to go through some of the products and the tools that I use, and I'm including in this app I clean my brushes. Um, and then I'll do the demonstration and then see if there's any questions. So this is a composite of different photographs I've pulled of the art that I like, including mine. And what you see here, or I hope you see, is dark and light and texture and depth. And this is one of Jacques Vesely's places. Um, it's probably only this big. But what you see in here is the different shades of green and light and shadows and depth. And that's all done dry painted, probably 50 coats of paint at least. Mm. This is another one of his pieces. Here he's into the reds, the oranges, and the golds. And as you can see, the changes of the color, you don't see the transition, but when you look closely, you see, oh, there's yellow, and, oh, there's white, and now I see burgundy. And the third piece, this is probably the same size as my little spears. He used a magnet to hold that onto the wood. I don't know how he got the magnet inside, so I don't think it's a hollow sphere. Whoops. Sorry. And then Dick's with another one of um, Jacques. This is supposed to look like orc. And I actually tried to do that with this piece here, which I'll pass around. 
but I couldn't get the colors right, so I decided it needed to be green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Supposed to look like what? Bark on a tree, which is 50 shades of gray, okay. and I tried that, and it wasn't working for me, so I just started with another color. I don't think anything I've ever done has ended up the way I envisioned it. It's all opportunity along the way. And then Dixie Biggs, a lot of you know Dixie, she's from Florida, she does wonderful carvings and painting at the same time. And you can see a lot of shades of green in there, but what you don't see is all the puddling up in the texture of paint, and that's because it's done with a dry brush technique. Another one of hers, and this one I came across and I've added it to my, to my deck because I really like that where she brings <coughs> in all of the colors even on the edges of the leaves and the way that she did the bark and got that. And then there's this piece here that I did. Once I realized, I went to um, the Gagar's class with um, Don and Kat, and we uh, made all this off-the-wall embellishments, and I really liked it, so I had to come home and buy an NSK. Very expensive <laughs> class. <laughs> so this was the first, actually this one was the first piece. I just turned something around and hollowed it a bit with a portion of it, and I decided I would make a little cottage. My mother actually collected David Winter's cottages. It's a British thing. But they're very detailed cottages. We can be the church, the school, and everything. So I sketched one out in the round to figure out the dimensions. And then just started carving away, putting holes in it. I painted the inside gold. And the whole idea is to put one of these fake candles underneath it and let it illuminate. I tried to light it in here, but it's just too bright. You wouldn't see the effect. Um, so I'll pass this one around. So that one wasn't as bright as I wanted, so then I did this one, and I did stairs on both sides, um, added some flowers, and made it look like a straw thatch roof. And again, this was all just dry painted, but I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Is the straw thatched roof kind of like the bark on the um, one that showed before? Is it that same color thing with a hundred different shades? Of no, I actually went for yellow on that one. And then the sphere that I already have going around the room. And then this is the, um, the other one. I call this Starry Nights, and that's what I was trying to go for. <coughs> I don't think this one's in the photo, but this is a little, it's a candle kit I think I got from Craft Supplies. It's for an oil candle, and it comes with a wick, and it even comes with a little um, funnel so you can put the oil in and you have to cut the wick. But I really played around with this book uh, called Nature, I don't know the title of it, but Nature, everything in nature has been magnified 10,000 times. So this is a drop of, of dew on a blade of glass magnified 10,000 times. And I really liked the coloring on it, so I went ahead and I did it on this. And I actually happen to have a hollow form at home now. It's kind of teardrop shaped, and I think I'm gonna put this on that, because mm -hmm. I just started doing the hollow forms. Oh, yes. After you pull this off the lathe to embellish, approximately how much time? I don't vary from item to item, but what amount of time do you think you put into something? The carving around, I followed the grain lines. The carving was probably an hour, and then I probably stopped because my hand just cramps up yeah. and gets numb and it's very painful. And then I went back to it and I painted the whole thing black. Well, probably to do all the little dots with a um, tool, which I'll show them in a second, probably took another 30 minutes. It's really, it takes more time to clean it off with a brush brush than it does to actually do the work. Um, and then the painting, it's hard to say because I do it watching TV with a glass of wine. So it's kind of very relaxing. How big your wine glass? Bottomless. <laughs> Um, so sometimes it takes longer, sometimes I have to stop. I have needy dogs, not that they would call themselves needy, but they make me stop for breaks and stuff, which is good because my hand's about cramping and I time it so that. Um, you can go fast, but it's not gonna have a good quality. Slow is really good with us, and I have to slow myself down because I'm so anxious to get to the end result that sometimes, and if it's late at night, I have to actually force myself, stop now or you're gonna mess this up because you wanna get done. And the next morning I realize I stopped just in time. So this plate here, I did, actually you can cut this out of the video. I have somebody who wants me to make this for them in a 10 inch plate, so I am desperately seeking a maple platter, like if anybody should have one, Daniel would 
Anybody? I need a blank for this. You want maple? Yes, maple because I wanted. She wants exactly the same thing, but she wants it bigger. Ten inches. To end up to be a ten inch platter. So five inch and three quarters thick. And this piece here. Sorry. This piece here was at the Florida Symposium and actually was selected to be critiqued, so I was very excited about that. And the next morning at breakfast, somebody bought it. So I and they paid more than the asking price because they didn't have change, and they said keep the change. Fully assured it when I mailed it to them. <laughs> I've actually asked us, okay, but I need to take it home because I haven't taken the glamour shot yet. Because I wait till I have five or six pieces and I set up the whole photo studio and take the pictures. So with this one, I had to take a picture of it, and I was still, it was my most recent and favorite piece, so it's always hard to give them away until you have a new favorite. So, but the money really talked. So this one I did, I've been taking Zentangle on my own, on and off, and Zentangle, if you don't know what it is, is a meditative doodling, very thoughtful, and it has some rigid rules around it. So I consider what I do is Zentangle inspired art. And I've been going through it and looking for patterns that I think would translate well to the wood for the textures and the embellishments. <coughs> and I happened to come across this one called Fission. Now, I think Rebecca called it um, germs and bacteria, but it's really Fission. <laughs> um, and so I used the cuppers. And I don't know, how many of you are familiar with cuppers on a um, <laughs> microwave? Anybody? I'll pass this around for some of you that may not be. This, they come in all sizes, but it's actually the heat turns it and they're um, fluted on the inside, so it makes you a nice domed indentation. When you use these though, you have to clean them constantly because otherwise the carbon and fibers build up and you get flat domes. So you probably will even find as you're looking at them some flat domes because I didn't check plate enough. So I'll pass that around. Tracy, what do you clean them with? Um, I start with a brass brush, even with the micro motor on sometimes, oh, okay. but sometimes it doesn't do it, so I take a dental tool with a very sharp point and I get in there and okay. scrape it out. Because as you can imagine, that one took a lot of doing. Mm -hmm. And I do different sizes, but I really was pleased with that. And when I did that piece, I didn't have a top for it. And it got done and I just didn't feel like it was done. So I decided to make a finial, and again, with no plan, went out there, started turning it, and it just came to me that I should shape it like the body. And then I said, well, you need to add a little black rim. And then I was like, well, now you need to go texturize it. And I thought when I got it all done, what I should have done is made the top a hollow form, too. Oh. Next one, I'm going to do that. So the little piece would come out of the top one, and the top one, kind of like those dolls, but my own version. So I passed this one around already. This is the one I was supposed to look like tree bark, um, but I didn't like the way it was coming out, so I just switched gears and went to greens and yellows. And that was the second piece I hollowed. I recently purchased Trent Bosch's visualizer and stabilizer so I could do more hollow forms because you can see embellishment better on something that rises up than goes out flat. So this piece here, I thought I had it with me. I'm not seeing it. Um, but what I do with these, this is another Gentangle pattern, the same one that's on the blue, is I fill out a grid and I put my dots and I trace it and I'll pass it around and I carve it so that it gets indented and has some depth. Can you show that to the, uh, the, the camera? Yeah, I'm going to take that. Sure. Yeah. Which, just, for the, just for the zoom, just for which, whichever one you want. Okay. Is that the overhead? Maybe better in the light. Mm -hmm. You can see that one. I actually put the dots a half inch a spot, and then you kind of, as you can see, curve in or curve out, alternating to get the pattern. And then I take tools um, with my NSK, which I'm going to be pass that around. But I use this very, very tiny burr to go around. No, actually, first thing I did with it was the NSK, and I have a um, like a router base for it that holds it, and I go around and just score the lines. And I'll show you a piece on how I do it. And then I, um, on this one, I decided I like that. Can we go back to that? To the PowerPoint? That PowerPoint, Lin linen look, I was supposed to be leather, but it looks like material, so now I say I do a linen piece. 
And I really just did that with the burrs on the carver and rotating it in a forward way and then I would change the direction as the basket would change. And then I painted the whole thing black so that I could start painting it. Um, because I work on small pieces, this, this thing is a little bit big to pull off the edges. You know, and you put that uh, hand piece back here. I have this hand piece, which is to the NSK, and I put it down in here and get the right depth. And I have a board that has different depths in 1 increments. And I'll get to the right depth, and you can trace around and have constant depth to do things. But this was so big that my cousin, who's an engineer and has access to a really cool 3D printer, may need this little tiny one, and this is the first prototype. We need to add a better twist mechanism or a wing nut or something, because it's hard to tighten it up two-handed. But this will also help me when I'm going around things that are a lot smaller. I don't go off the edge. Got it. Okay. PowerPoint. Okay, so I also, in preparation, I need more samples of some of the different textures and colors that I've done. So um, I'm going to pass these around, but it's probably easier to see them up there. Um, I did similar patterns and did different colors. Um, this one here, I did um, just the wavy lines here, just a lot of indentations. And then I also did this without any texture, because I wanted to see the effect of dry brush painting on something flat that didn't have profile to it, and to see if I could get the paints to blend that way. And then this again is that Huggins and Tangle, which looks more like leather. And then the same patterns. We're actually going to do this one in green today. Um, I just changed out the colors. And this one I used a burner with a spiral, but I really didn't like the way it came out. But what I found is just by doing these sample storyboards, I'm thinking ahead to my next projects and what I want to do in the color. So it's a really good exercise. I've also written some of the colors on the back that I use so that when I go back to it, because colors have some funky names that I would know what they are. Things like <coughs> middle, azo, yellow, and I can't even say this, bismuth, vanadate, yellow, and different <coughs> names. So I'll pass these around as well. Yeah. So before I start getting ready to paint, I brought this example, and I guess maybe this one would be good to do close up. So when we come back over here, overhead. So when I get ready to do one, I see, you can see here where the pencil lines are, where I've just driven waves through it. And then here, where I've taken the NSK and traced out my path. And then you can see as I come around to this side, there's some relief in there. I'm actually trying to get some downslope to it. And after I get the downstroke, you can see over in this section where I've undercut. And I use my wood burner and I use a small skew, and I sharpen it like crazy on a homing card. I learned that from Donna and Sybil's fan field. Um, and it makes it sharp so that you're not just burning, you're actually able to slice into the wood, which is important to keep taking the carbon off with a brass brush so that you have a really shiny, sharp blade. And I will redo it when the heat's on sometimes to just put that edge back on. And you obviously know about a sharp edge and turning. Well, it's the same thing when you're cutting into the burning. And then once I have it all undercut, I might go back and, and shape it a little more and add in some undulations. And then I texturize it. And I actually use this tool with a very small little uh, ball on the end. And I just, so you want to probably know how long that takes, right? <laughs> a good hour. And you usually have to break because I'm holding it so long that my hand just starts to freeze up. I got it so bad, it felt like electricity was shooting through it and I lost control because I pushed the envelope. So I really try to work for 40 minutes, give the dogs a treat, take a break, do it again, but I have to start and stretching my hand out. I think my, these two fingers are permanently curling on me now from all the tools I hold. So I'll pass this piece around. This was one, um, actually, Harold had, had suggested that I make for demonstration purposes so you can see the progression of getting the material prepared. And I'll pass this around right now, but this is the piece we're actually going to paint. So. I do need to Okay. At the Gainesville um, demonstration, we did this one, very similar. It was painted black, and we went through greens and blues and yellows. You're going to have to move faster. I can't. This is another sample.
schedule that I have when I was practicing dry brush techniques with different um, different patterns on it to see where what colors I like. And then at Christmas time at Woodcraft, they were selling that Clara Walnut on occasion, and every time the price went down, I would buy a few pieces. Then the price would go up when I wait. And so I started making Christmas trees out of it. And this one I actually, um, after I turned it, I took one of the tools with the rotary, um, trying to think of the name of those tools, um, the little yellow and green burrs. Oh, okay. yeah. Saber burrs. Yes, saber tooth. I, I just kind of go in one direction down so it's combing in very light lines. And then I dry brushed it with a very, very dry white brush. And then I thought it wasn't enough, so I went back with a little small, probably two millimeter ball, ball and just went around the edges and then highlighted them with gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I ended up a few pieces that were too pretty to do that too, so I left them as natural. And then this one last piece that I have with, oh, I have one more too. Um, I tried using the, the, the pretzels or the saber tooth, probably the quarter inch ball, and as I started doing it, I thought about flowers. So I just started putting the flowers in there, and then I used the cup burr to do the center and then painted it with a dyed red. <coughs> so this piece is my latest, it's not done yet, but I thought I would show it because it's another really good example of color. And I'm not sure if I'm going to make a finial, what, if I might put copper on the outside or something. So it's not done. So if you had french fries before you came here, do not touch this. <laughs> no greasy hands. Somebody asked before, do I put a finish on my stuff? And the answer is no. And I'll look more into my, my paint and supplies, but if it was going to be a necklace like this and I was going to touch it and rub on things, I probably would put some sort of finish. What? I don't know. But for something like that, I don't, because I think the finish would fill in the texture and take away from what I was trying to achieve. Get back to the PowerPoint. <coughs> All right, so now I'm going to sit back down. Um, I will pass around some of my brushes, though, because I'm going to talk about two different types of brushes. And I have no brand specific of these deer foot brushes. Um, I try different brands. I see no difference. The only thing I've found is I can be very aggressive getting the paint off, and I've actually shoved the bristles right back into the ferrule. So later I have to, like, yank them out and, and take pliers and till they bring them. Of these around in different sizes so you can see them up close. And you call them what then? Deer foot. But if you think of a horse or a deer, it's kind of an oval foot and there's a slope to it. And with those, you paint in one direction, which I'll get into. I'll pass one of these around, but I will get to it in a minute um, after when I start talking about it. Okay, so in preparation to work on the pieces, like the black one that's going around, I use, um, have been using gesso, and I don't know if it was gesso or gesso, like I say produce and produce, and I never know which is right because I've said them wrong so many times, um, to put down a black, very solid background, because everything I paint I do with a black background. It shows the colors better, and um, it gives you just a nice palette to work on. Um, the other thing I've started doing, which I did on this piece that's going around it, is I've started using black acrylic ink. It's thinner, it flows on better, and I feel like it will huddle into the texture as much as the black gesso. So this piece that's going around that's all black, that one I did with the acrylic ink. And I got it from Liquitex, and I actually got it on Amazon. Um, and then I use this stuff called GAC 100, it's a um, acrylic primer and extender. So when you see me push out my paints here, I'm gonna actually add a drop of it to each one and it'll keep it from drying out. Because you use so little paint when you dry brush that it dries out on your palette before you can get to it all. And you're having to stop and get your paint back out. Meanwhile, your brushes are drying out because they were never very wet to begin with. So I learned to use this and I put probably one drop to a teaspoon of paint or one of those little palette plates that go around, probably a drop. Sometimes I get aggressive and put two, or because it's an oops. And then I use golden paints. 
They come in different sizes, but this is the smallest size. And there's three different types. There's the so flat, which is what I like, because I like the flat paint. And then there's also the, um, the fluid, which comes in a whole lot more variety of colors than the flat paints. And then there's what's called high flow. And the high flows, they go on like an ink, not a dye where they dry in, but they just flow around. They're very fluid. And there may be occasions for that. I haven't really used them much, um, but I'm sure I'll find a way. Okay, this is a picture of the zero foot brushes that are going around. And I've used them consistently up until the big piece that I've just sent around is the first one I've tried using different brushes. And they come in different sizes. And then I found this place called Artist Opus Brushes. It's a British guy, and I'm not sure exactly how I came across them, but they make these brushes that are more tapered. on all sides. And what I find is I can paint in multiple directions. With the deer foot brushes, I'm doing this the whole time. And with these, I can come from any direction and get it. And, and when I'm painting, I can be turning this in my hand and getting the fresh paint and not worry. With the deer foot brushes, there's the angle. If I was to go back up, I'm gonna catch all the paint that's on here and probably by that time, the paint has started drying and getting a little grit on it, and that's just gonna be ne very negative in what you're trying to do. So I actually really like those other brushes. I don't think I'll wanna move away from these, but I really like the other ones. PowerPoint. So it came in this case, <coughs> you can see up there, and I'm just gonna hold this up. One of the things that came with it is called a texture pack. And it's got something engraved in it. This is a cityscape. There's a whole bunch of different themes and bigger sizes. But what I found is when I'm painting, I'm able to offload some of my paint first on the palette and then here to see if it's too much paint or what it's going to look like. Even for cleaning my brushes, I use this. And it's just MDF work that's been engraved. Um, and I found it very helpful for seeing the color. And I'll pass this around, but I need it back for the thing. You can see how you can. Gotcha. See the texture. And what they also do is when I'm painting, I'll show you, is I have this little sponge foam piece in here, and I'm going to add just a drop of water to it. And while I'm painting, I'm going to constantly go back to this and keep my brush damp. It'll help pull out the paint that's already in the brush, and it'll also help it from drying up and getting the little gritty pieces. I'm sure there's a technical word for it, but the little gritty pieces, and sometimes I call them worse. <laughs> What's next, back to the PowerPoint. So some of the other tools that I use, you can see another example of the texture pad there, is I use makeup brushes, I mean lipstick brushes, because they're foam, they're small, and they can get into places, um, you guys might want to check these out too, <laughs> um, that you can't normally get. I'm, I'm just using it for so many different things. If I don't want to get a print brush dirty and that'll work, I will use that. Are those washable? Yes. But I throw them out because we can buy like a hundred of them for a couple dollars. Oh, so okay. I got them in mass quantity. Um, so the last time in the demo, were asking me how I sand things. A couple of the tools I use are, I think these are called ripplers. Yeah. I didn't know the name before, but they call them. They come in different shapes. So I can go around and get into some of the areas to defuzz and so forth. And the other thing I use, and these come in all different, the, the handles in different colors, and the bands come in different grits. And you can use these where you have this rounded edge or you have a pointier edge. And when you need to move it, you just kind of press them and rotate it around the band so that you can get a new fresh piece of sandpaper like this. Get all these examples out of the way. Somebody wanted to know what a microcarver looked like. So this is the handset to my microcarver. And I'll just throw a couple of the, the burrs that I use in there. This one here is, you could probably put it on the overhead. Hello? You can see the dome shape is flat. I use this to cut under. After I put the first undercut, this one will very cleanly. And because it's flat on the bottom, it kind of smooths out where I may have kind of caused some problems trying to get under. So I'll pass that one. 
that thing in there for it. Is that before or after wood burning? I'm, I'm not so great yet that I have to keep fixing my errors. So it's a little bit of this. Okay, now I've taken out my undercuts because I sanded it off. So I gotta go back and then I burn. So it's just a process. But I learned so much by making mistakes. I, it's not really frustrating. It's like, oh, I know not to use that. Or, oh, this is the burr I want to use next time. So everything I do is about learning. This is one of the ones that I would use to do all my dimples with. And that one, I think I one more smaller, I can get underneath and sand because sometimes you leave a lot of fuzzy stuff and then when you start painting is when you see it. I'm not passing around my NSK because it's hundreds of dollars and if you were to drop it, you'd have to buy me a new one. I don't think you really want people it. Um, okay, I'm gonna pass this tray around after I open this up. All the burrs that go with the NSK, I've got this tape down because if you shake this, they come out of the container and it's like picking up pieces of rice and putting them in the holes. It's nice and I have to it under it and sink down, it should be safe. I also use palette paper, and palette paper is two-sided. One side is non-absorbent, and the other side is just like normal paper, a certain amount of absorbency. So what I do is I take it and I fold it over so I can put my paint on the shiny, non-absorbent side, and when I'm taking the paint off the brush, I can use the other side. But sometimes I get desperate and I use the brown paper and paper towel, it just depends, but it's usually the paper on both sides. But now that I have my texture pad still coming around, Okay. Um, I will need that for painting. I, I use that more so I'm not having to take as much paint off onto the paper. Um, they can also buy little micro brushes that come in different millimeter sizes. And they're in the hobby centers for people who do the small models and things. But they're very good for just getting in one little area of paint and just check it out. Um, frog tape. I actually use that frog tape only because it has a container that keeps dust and dog hair off of the edges. How many of you have had a roll of tape where when you unwind it, you just got fuzz all down the edges because it's sat open in your shop? So I bought that when I saw somebody using it. But I could care less what tape's inside of there. I just know I've got it protected so that when I do tape something up, and I do a lot of taping, like the piece that's going around, I had to tape all that black with blue tape just so when I was dry brushing, I could get it. So I want my tape to be very clean. Um, I'll take the thing. I didn't necessarily use wet palette paper. That was just a picture I could get off the internet. So again, I'm also going to as I go talk about brush cleaning. They have something called a paint purger, which if you wash your brush in that a little bit, it softens the, the hard bits that are present on your brush, and then you just kind of, you know, using I'll show you later, wipe it off. And when you feel like you soften it up, you can move on to a brush cleaner and clean the brush. And then I have to have a conditioner that I'll put on at the end, it's like soap, and then I'll let it dry overnight and it holds the brush in, and the next day you can just kind of knock off the flakes to it, and it's done. So last night, or yesterday, I looked at all of my Deerfoot brushes, and some of them were in very bad shape, so I thought, what a great chance to test out the system really carefully with a maintenance, not just a while you're doing it thing. And I did, and I went through all the brushes and decided that they had the little grainy bits that I would do the purger, and I got them all clean, and I was amazed how much. And even while I was doing the um, that piece there, um, I was using the soap cleaner to clean off the brush if it got too heavy, so I could switch to the next one. But it's good to have multiple brushes. Okay, um, color wheel. It's really good to understand a color wheel and what colors go together and complement each other. Um, one of the things I'm finding is you can't mix red and green because you get brown. You can't mix blue and orange because you don't get a gator, you get brown. So if you're going to work your way and you want to incorporate those colors, you actually have to work your way around the color wheel. So if I wanted to get to green, I'd probably have to start shading in the yellows and oranges. The oranges get to the yellows to get the greens to come up. Um, and, and work my way there. I'm not doing it yet. I'm kind of staying close in a family with my greens and yellows and blues or the reds and the oranges. I haven't tried to cross over, but I'm sure there's a way. I just haven't figured that out yet. 
Okay, so our demonstration today on the long boards going across the one little green square is what we're going to do and on the black one. And I passed this one around where you can see I did the light pencil lines, I did a gentle scoring with the NSK, I added some slope, I did the undercutting and burning, and then I did texturizing, and in the very corner I put the black coat. So you can kind of see the progression of how whatever pattern I do, I goes around this way. And again, the preparation a little bit bigger, getting to the final one. Any questions until we're done? Yes. Curious, why do you call it dry brushing? I mean, the paint looks wet. I mean, so what's the difference, a wet brush to dry brush? Well, I'm about to show you, but if you do wet brush, you're going to see the paint go on. You're going to see it pretty much cover the surface you're painting. When you dry brush, you're putting so little on that it takes several coats to even see it. But it builds up the paint in such a way that it doesn't take away from the texture. <coughs> if I was to take any one of these pieces and take paint and paint on it, it would lose the dimension or the definition, I should say, that you have. So with the dry brushing, you're barely putting it on, and it's drying so quickly, you can handle it while you're painting it. And while it's drying, you're ready to get the next coat on with less chance of it bleeding unless you're trying to get green from blue and down yellow. Is it, is it water-based or? Mm -hmm. It is. And, and I'll be wet, wetting my brush to keep the brush wet because yeah. it dries out so fast because you use up the paint. Okay. And what, what is the paint that, that you use again? It's from a company called Golden. And we need to get back Did to that. Did you have an PowerPoint? example of the paint can? Or what yeah, I'll put it. Okay. Oops, there. Golden is the name of the company okay. that makes the acrylic. You can get these either from Golden or from Dick Blick or even on Amazon. Um, just figure out which one's got the best deal with your shipping and everything. Um, some of you want to ask, these little ones are anywhere from six to twelve dollars, depending on the color. And the thing about Golden paints is they actually test their paints. And they even put the actual paint, I think somebody in the factory paints the bottles with the samples so you know what you're getting. And it'll say an ASGM number, which is really is it's vulnerability to light. But the other thing it'll talk about, you'll see a little square. If that square is all black, it's opaque. If it's half black and half clear or half white, it's semi-opaque. If it's white with a diagonal line, it's semi-transparent. And if it's just a white box with a black outline, it's transparent. So that helps you keep in mind what you're doing with your paints. Because I tried to put something very transparent on top, and it went on more like a wash. You could still see the colors underneath. Tracy, I had a uh, Zoom question. It was a while back, though, unfortunately. Uh, Dion asked if um, what are the bare bones, wood burning tips and pins needed to do the patterns you do? The question for if you didn't hear that is what are the bare bone um, tools, tips that I use to make the patterns that I do? For wood burning, I use my short angles fuse so much because I do small stuff and it's small enough that if I'm gonna curve, it'll curve. It's, you know, some of the skews that are straight are a quarter inch wide, but it's too wide for what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm not a pyrographer. I use it more for carving and texturizing. I use the, on the, um, what else do I use? The little balls that come in like point something millimeters all the way up to one, sometimes I will use those, but if it comes to that, I kind of like using the NSK better. I think that would answer the question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? Yeah. All right, let's paint. Yes. Oh, my daughter who had Alfredo's auto like you see just one minute. I use it every day. Just take it and dip my hands in hot wax. Five coats. Does it make the paint soft? All these yet, we were done with that. Okay, so do I can I get that black piece back? That's my demo. This one, yes. So I used to use little.
little sticks to pull the paint out. And now I just kind of go like this, take a little bit of paint, drop it on here, and wipe it off. And then we're going to put out a little bit of this. That one is olive green, and this one is light green yellow. I like it because it has a pop to it, which really shows up. I've got beauty colors, don't you? This is, I can't drink them more. Oh, I didn't even use this one. <laughs> Brought my trash bag. Uh So were you those putting that on the palette paper you were talking about? Yes, this is okay. on the palette paper, and this is the shiny side, okay. and this is the back, so I just folded it over and reversed it. I noticed you've got little squares of Kleenex or whatever you're using, but I think it's a neat idea. It's paper towel. Just paper towel. I ripped towel. it up. They tear on the side evenly, and I just tear a bunch up. I don't know, why you flip them together? Yeah. I swear I want to write to the paper towel people and I can want a pop-up box of little pieces of paper towel so I don't have to cut them up. I hear you. I just think it's a really nice, efficient way of doing it. Even at home in the kitchen, I do that. I tear off pieces of paper towel because I hate waste. It's like one of my things. So I'm pouring all these out now because I am going to add the gap to them so they shouldn't dry up on me. Okay. So which of the... Goldens is that? I mean, is that you? You're talking about that container size, so as opposed to the fluid acrylics and all of that. So what's what is this? This is the mat, so flat. Mat, so mm -hmm. that's it, so flat. Okay. And I have this old paperweight; it just keeps them in place. You're so much neater than I am. You haven't seen my desk at home. <laughs> not dry up on me. And I may need to add more just to see how I like here. Now this is that bottle of the get me. Just a mist, just enough that it's damp. Okay. 
Okay, so one of the things I do is you notice on here it's undercut. So if I was to brush, the undercut is going down this way. If I have to brush this way, I'd probably be forcing paint into the underneath. And one of the reasons I think that this black is to keep shadows and depth in there. So I'm always going to watch in this pattern, it's all this way. But you could have something where the patterns change it. So you have to be aware of the area you don't want the paint to touch and the ones you do. I think I said it takes about 10 coats before you see the color. So it's like watching grass grow. And then all of a sudden it's there. So what I'll first do is I'll just pull a little bit of paint out of the side. I'm going to move it around on here so I don't feel like it's coming off. I always kind of do a test on my hand. If it comes off on my hand, it's too much paint. Okay. And I don't have quite enough. I'm going to just do that to get it damp. And you see how much better when it's damp, it moves around. Okay, I don't feel it on my hand. So I'm just going to stop. And I'm just randomly doing this. And I'm just going to flip down. And you're trying to make sure you can see it on the camera. Come back with Can I tail stop? And I'm taking it off of my texture pad. And I'm seeing what the color looks like there. And I'm just going to brush everywhere. You can't see anything. All I kind of see is the black as it looks so black. Now, is that your second coat of paint? Do you consider that the second coat? Mm -hmm. Not quite, because I'm still getting around. But it will take me quite a few. And as I'm turning this, I'm turning it, I'm only going this way. And you might see that the brush is rotating so I don't have any wet spots. And I'll come over here. Now I'm starting to see the green, but we've got a few more coats. How hard are you brushing that? I mean, very lightly. You want to just barely touch the surface. Otherwise, you're pushing the brush into your texture. You want to hit the highlights. Highlights. Oops. See now there, I have a piece, you see that? Yeah. Quickly gone. It's another reason I keep a lot of towels ready, just if I have to wipe anything up. That's, That's better. better. That's better. That's much better. Yeah. Okay, I think you can start to see some of the green yeah. coming yep. together. Yep. See what you mean about your hand getting tired. Oh, that's with the micro motors and the things. This one is not so bad because I'm very, very lightly holding this brush. Mm -hmm. I don't have a death grip on it. But that part gets clear as well. But I really like these brushes. The paint comes off better. It's kind of just going in a clockwise manner. I kind of look to see where it doesn't look even. See, it's a little more green yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. You have to have good light there too, don't you? Yes, and I have these little hot lights. I used to have this long, big one that really worked well. It kept me hot, but I what a loom. So now it's over my loom, so I'm used to these. This one's actually cordless, but usually it's not good for art because you'd have to stick it right on top of your art. But I do like this one. Now you see how that when it's coming out, as soon as I touch the water there, it pulls that paint out of the brush. And we'll just do a check. On the Artist Dash Opus website, there are lots of YouTube videos on dry brush painting, dry brush, how to take care of your brushes. They do models with terrain and machinery and a whole world I don't know anything about, but there's some excellent um, videos on the dry brush technique. When you get to a point where you feel like you're not bringing out your color anymore because the black background, that's when I'll just start blending in either another color or I'll go over it with some white because then when I come back on top of the white, 
you don't have that dense color in there, and it actually allows it to come through more. Wow. Okay. Yeah. My hand is looking good too. Yeah. Yes. So I'm showing my hand too. You need to paint your fingers black first. Yes, I need to match my nail polish to the demonstration that way you never know. <laughs> All right, one or two more coats of the green. Um, I'll switch it up and start introducing another color. Do you have to let that dry though for a while? Or oh, it's immediate? I can just cast it around and touch it. It's oh, such okay. a light amount of paint, it dries, which I like because I'm no patient. So now what I'm going to do is I picked up some green. I might see a hair coming out of here. And I'm going to pick up just a little of the other color. So I'm going to start my transition. And you can almost. It's better to go dark to light with your colors. Mm -hmm. Okay. For a non artist. And my mother was an artist. She did. She was a very pretty famous equine artist, horses. And she could make a horse look like a photograph. And she knew the anatomy. She knew where every muscle, the proportions, the veins were. And she was. I say lazy, but she would never really work hard at it. I mean, she would get tons of money when she would do one. And she had a list when she died of 30 people waiting for paintings. And we were always so frustrated because we were kind of poor, like, Mom, please, paint. <laughs> the worst of these shoes or whatever, so she would do it. Um, but I now I'm starting to understand, because I have so many hobbies and serial artists, that you have to be in the mood. And you can't have a doctor's appointment in three hours, or you can't get home at three in the afternoon and pick up a hobby necessarily, right. depending on how you are. So I'm understanding it a little bit more about her need to paint when she the mood hit her. I can't tell you how many paintings she used to donate a, a painting to a horse show award ceremony every year, and a high point person got a painting, and so many times that painting came wet, and she's like, "Don't touch it, I'm gonna take it back." Because <laughs> she is a procrastinator. Okay, so it's getting a little lighter now, and I'm introducing more and more of this other green. Some more water. And I'm going to test it here. You see that on the pad? Now you're going to see it get a little bit lighter. Yeah. Can you stay on this view, Carol? I think this is a good one. Mm -hmm. So what's your goal here? Because you're you're putting you're going from a darker to a lighter over the same surface area, so are you doing it so that you're not completely covering up the first coat? Yes, and and some like a cloud effect. I don't want to cover everything. It may look like I am, but when I start doing the highlights, I will leave some of the darkers around. And that's what dry brushing helps with because you're not splashing on a bunch of paint. You have control. And sometimes it's just an extra flip. Like if I just stay here, you can see that corner getting brighter and brighter. Okay. And when I start adding in the yellow and the white, I'm not going to hit every area. And so right now, I should have some of that dark green. You're starting to see the lighter green. And now I'm going to introduce some yellow. Wet my brush again. Depending on what color you use, sometimes your brush gets so loaded with the color, you can't get lighter. And that's where I'll go to another brush or wash mine out. But by wetting it, sometimes you're pulling some of that excess color out. And let's see over here. Ooh, way too much. And as I do this, I turn the brush, because that's where the oops come when you get it on the wrong side. Yes, that's better. Okay, now we've added a little bit more yellow. take these up because I want to be able to use the other side. And I also take things up a lot when I'm carving and burning because I don't want the oops. I mean, how many have a little rotary motor go around the edge and hit the bottom side? So I put tape on it that kind of helps. Not always. 
That's usually when I know I need to stop because my hand is almost, I mean, I'm gonna add a little, we have the blonde hair. White, and you'll really see a difference then, but then I'm gonna go backwards. I don't think you put any white on it yet. No, not yet. I've added yellow, so I'm going to pick up a little yellow and just a touch of white, blend it in a bit, pull it off the brush as much as I can, and then test it. Whoa, see my hand there? Yes. That was way too much, so I'm glad I have the test pad. Or somebody asked me if I listen to music when I paint, and I do. And if I'm really focusing, I'll do something without vocals like classical or jazz. But if I'm really in the mood and want to go fast, it's Rolling Stones jam all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know I'm not really, I've never been a runner, but I've heard that runners can pick a beat they like to run to and they can make a playlist with all the songs that go to the right beat. And somebody said I should get a painter's playlist for my painting beats because I found myself sometimes going too fast, especially carving and burning, yeah. and I'm getting sloppy because I'm going really fast because of the music. Okay, so I'm going to go white now. I might have to switch brushes, but we'll see. And I will show you the process of cleaning the brush, too. Getting more white on it. switch brushes because I need the white to come through without the yellow. So you're not supposed to soak your brushes all the way in the water. You're supposed to keep the ferrules dry. And you can never let the paint come up close to the ferrule, but we all have a waste. And I use so, several things of water like this just so that I can keep getting to a cleaner bath. At home, I'm right next to the guest bathroom, but I hate getting up and down because every time I get up, the dogs think it's for them. <laughs> too wet, but it's keeping it from it going bad while I'm switching brushes. And I'm going to go. One of the things that artists Opus, the guy said, is use the biggest brush you can get away with, which is counterintuitive. Because I kept thinking, oh, I'm going to use a small one. Brush here. Um, I'm going to go for the white. If you do it right on your palette here, you could actually show your transition of colors and make something fairly artistic to go with it. Oh, I'm not there. brightness because of the white, but you have to not let that scare you because if I'm doing it right, when I put the next coat back on, it's going to pop because it's not got a dark background under it, it's got a light background. And now I'm not going to try to get every spot. So you're poking <coughs> it now, not brushing it? No. Oh yeah, okay. I'm probably a little bit more aggressive than usual, but I don't have a glass of wine. So now I'm going to go back and try adding the yellow. And that should pop a few sections. Probably 
to get too much off. Let's see here over here. You see how it's yeah. variegated a bit? And I still don't want to touch everything. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think it still needs more yellow. If I was to have a lot of paint on this brush, all of that little divots in there, you'd be puddling. I don't know the technical word, but I call it puddling in there, and you wouldn't see the texture. You can see probably right there. I probably have a little too much gotcha. in there. And sometimes I will just get it before it dries. You can get rid of it, but that's why testing over beer is so important because once you touch it to beer, you're good. So I'm going to go back in a couple places, just touch the green. This is probably dry up enough I'm going to go back to it. Yep, yep. And by going down and not coming up, you see how I'm not getting the black in the underneath part. Now, one of the things I did, where's that piece you holding on to? Paul, the one I said I just finished? <coughs> or not finished? Yes, that one. I actually, when I got done going around the little, um, everything's not here, um, squares, I went back with a tiny little brush with black and went in and just barely got where the shadows would be. Like you would do as if you're drawing, you would be adding shading. I went in back and shaded on that one and it made such a difference when I was done. And I never tried that before. So when you do the texture on that, is the stippling done with the micromotor and the NSK for the undercutting, or do you use NSK for everything? I go back and forth, whatever's working for me. I like the NSK more than I like the regular one. So when I do the stippling, that tray, there's a tiny, tiny little ball-shaped uh, burr. I use the tiniest one, and I always use sound effects, but you just want zzz, 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 like a dentist drill. And you just barely going in, and it's just compacting. It's pushing pressure down. It's not even carving. It's it's kind of just pushing it down. Um, and it makes it cleaner, and it's got the smallest spur that I can find to do this to so take it a or a cut? <coughs> that was it's a pressure like the engraver. Like it's what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because the micro is turning. Yeah. Right, right, right. But I just kind of push down. And I do it to a certain song that I have the same pressure every time, but all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of, you're going around and just keep looking. 
Some people will paint something black and then do that so they can see where they've missed and have those flat zones, which I tried tried to do once, but I'm just now I'll just put my hex set on. Which most of the time I'm not wearing this now. I wear this hex set, and it's got a set of five lenses in different sizes, powers, and you can it has two places that you can double them up. So even though you have five lenses, you have multiple combinations. I think if I know my math is the 14 combinations, I have a 2.5 in there. And this one is rechargeable LEDs, which are better than batteries, because batteries will just get weaker. With this one, it's either working or it's not. Um, when I recharge it, it has a light, two speeds, and it has a little magnifier that comes out. So if you really want to get close. And this makes such a difference in the quality of the things that I do that I didn't even realize how bad it was until I looked at this. So even <coughs> the painting, at this point, I might even get in there and, and start wearing that speech. And I always forget to turn this off, so I always have to recharge it. And I don't know necessarily because of the lighting I have if that lighting actually helps. So I'm going to call this one done. I'll pass it over while I show you how to clean the brush. I see a little white spot, but it's a demo piece. And you can even touch it. You'll see that it's dry. <laughs> it's so different in person than it was even on the screen. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So now to clean my brushes, I'm first going to get some of the paint off. So I'm going to use two. pop on this. I can't get my other colors to pop as much, so it's a work in progress. And it's just because I don't really have a lot of experience with color. Even some of the names of these colors are amazing. <laughs> but I try to watch a lot of YouTube and learn a lot of different things. When you say you're putting 50 or 60 or whatever coats of paint on, you think, oh my god. But as fast as that goes... And when you think you're done, you're not. Right. You've got to keep going to push yourself. Somebody else would say, no, keep going if they knew it. And I've had to make a figure right. I shot 10 minutes ago, it wasn't done. So this what is if you start. overdo it? What if you overdo it? Can you undo it? Can Probably you not? Okay. Not because dry brushing is supposed to be such a light coat mm -hmm. that if you overdo it, you're building up the paint and you're losing the definition that you were going for. Okay. In some cases, that might be desirable, but for me, I like the slow build up. So I just take a little bit of this purger, and I don't really have any hard spots, and I'll just put it in here. Um, you want to do overhead control? So I put some of this purger. It's purple only so that you don't mix it up with something else. The color is not important. I actually watched a video where really we use 91% um, alcohol, which probably is very similar to what this does. And I'm just going to wipe it around in there. Because I'm going to, I'm going to let this one sit for just a second while I do the other one. Oh, it can go from here yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I really wish they could come up with a pop up box for me. I think I was the first person that said mayonnaise should be in a squeeze bottle years before it happened. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I should get credit for that. Okay, so now I'm going to put this one in the purger, and it should just loosen up anything that might have dried inside my brush. And then I actually use this texture palette, and of course on the video you only go in one direction and wave the hold your brush and not do the power scrubs, but I'm a rebel sometimes. And now if I look in here, I don't feel anything gritty or anything, so it'll be ready to move to the next step. So this one, paint verger. He says 
a snug texture on it to help rub things out. And of course, I'm supposed to go in this direction to keep the brush shape. And what I learned is if you get the paint up into the, the barrel, it pushes your fibers or your hairs out, so you never get the shape that was originally intended. So whenever you paint, you're never supposed to get your paint up more than at least like halfway through your, your brush hairs. Um, but if you do, the purger helps get them out. And I've actually, when I was doing my whole trauma thing last night, taking your thumbnail and just kind of gently pulling them out. This didn't dry out enough to get any of it, but that would be what I would do with those. And I put it into another one not to contaminate them. So then I'm going to use the brush cleaner. If anybody needs any of these pipettes, I over-ordered and I have lots of them. <laughs> Which did actually remind me of a funny story. Um, years ago, my husband uh, was stationed in the military in Florida, Wales, and somebody, only about 300 Americans were there, and um, somebody had to order urine tests, you know, for drug testing. They didn't know what the word gross meant. Oh. <laughs> so for these 300 sailors, uh, they, they, a tractor trailer came. No. And no. it was enough. Somebody did the math. I could get the numbers. They could have tested every single person three times a day for five years. <laughs> <laughs> The company was really happy they got that order. Right. <laughs> All right, so now I'm just going to use paper towels, and when I see no color coming out, even if the brush has a little color, if it's not coming out, it's clean. And I'll peek like this, but this one's looking really good, so I'm going to go in there one more time and let that sit a minute. And the other one. But I did this to like 10 brushes last night, and I was just amazed at how clean and I could get them. How long do your brushes last? They're quite a few. I haven't burned any out yet. Oh, at all. And these, are, these weren't cheap. I want to make these last. That's yeah. why I'm tonight here cleaning and you can put it in. So these are pretty clean right now. So the other thing I have in the kit is this brush cleaner conditioner. And it's like soap. Tracy? Yes, sir. When you have the cleaner on the, um, or the purger, and then you rub it on your board, or paper towel or a rag. But you, you're using your board, mm -hmm. but doesn't, it doesn't... Um, that paint's already dry, it doesn't come back off. It, so, it, okay, that won't affect mm -hmm. you. Now, if I had had little grits in this, when I was going over the towel, oh, see, look, you can see, see, look, you can see here, I gotta move it over to the overhead, please. And I don't know if you can see it, but when I did this, that little black speck right there came out. Then you know it's working, and you just see, it looks like, we eggs. <laughs> this is the first thing I thought of when I saw them. So this one, nothing's coming out of this one. Yeah, but these didn't get dried out. But if they had, you would see just all like little pepper all over it. So I can close this up so I don't spill it. And then this comes in different sizes, and it looks like soap, feels like soap, and. <coughs> There's a video on this whole process, and then there's another video of a guy said, if you don't want to go through that and buy that, buy your alcohol, and he does it a different way. And sometimes you have to keep going back and cleaning it. So this one's very soapy, and it's clean, but I'm not going to rinse it out. I'm going to form my brush by turning it, trying to get it back to its original shape, and then I'm going to let it dry overnight. And in the morning, I'm just flip the flaky soap off, and it'll be fine. This one too. And you might need to add a hair, bit of water. These are still damp enough to get the soap up. But you want to get a pretty good lather. It's going to depend on how dirty your brush has gotten. I was working with fairly light colors. And I just kind of, I can see the soap on my hand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see some black stuff on there from before. So I'm going to feel like I don't see any dark paint. I don't see any grit. I've conditioned them. They're not at the same color necessarily, but I don't feel like there's anything in here. And I'm just now just making sure it's all coming up that way. And I don't want to condition on it. And then when I get home, I'll I actually today rip my little sponge in half. So I have to find some of this cheap foam and cut little circles of it. You can buy them online. I didn't say about gluing it, but once it's in here, it really doesn't matter. It's always a bit aggressive trying to get the old paint out. 